Welcome to the Hour of Power with Robert Schuller, brought to you from the beautiful campus of the Garden Grove, California Community Church. Today, you will be a part of the largest interfaith service in the history of the state since Father Nebro Serra brought Christianity to California. Dr. Schuller welcomes to his pulpit Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. Nearly 12,000 people are gathering in the walk-in church, the garden sanctuary, and the drive-in church. In a moment, you will see Dr. Schuller and Archbishop Sheen making their entrance into the great glass cathedral. Together, Dr. Schuller and Archbishop Sheen invite you to let Christ come into your life today, and this will be your Hour of Power. This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. A wonderful welcome to you worshiping today in this church. New life is surging in the springtime soil and is about to break forth in bud and in new green leaf. And new life is about to break forth in your heart and in your life, for God is here and will give you a new burst of faith. God bless you.
peace, love, faith, courage, power. Lord, send these gifts into the shaft of our heart and into the hidden hallway deep in our soul, for we worship you. Amen. Hear now the word of our Lord from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 7. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they who were persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Let your light therefore so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father who is in heaven. May God bless this reading of his holy word. Let us prepare to pray. happy and a hopeful people, O oh Father, for a world that not many months ago looked like it was going to tear itself apart seems to be calming down and coming together again in sanity. And a church that not long ago looked like it was dying now is recovering. Thy power is restoring thy church, O oh Lord, and like a wounded giant it is about to rise again, its ancient muscles rippling, 
and we believe that through your power it shall stand with broad shoulders echoing its loud, happy gospel down the corridors and canyons of our country at the end of this century. And let thy blessing rest then, O Father, upon thy church, upon thy servant, the Archbishop Fulton Sheen, who speaks to us this morning. And may every heart in the sound of our voice be touched with the finger of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Where cross the crowded ways of life, where sound the cries of race and clan, above the noise of selfie strife, we hear thy voice, O Son of Man. O Master from the mountainside, make haste to heal these hearts of pain. Among these restless throngs abide, O oh, tread the city streets again, till sons of men shall learn thy love and follow where thy feet have trod, till glorious from thy heaven above shall come the city of our God. We always have so many happy people visiting with us every Sunday, and we welcome you to this church. I would like all of us now to feel how full our hearts are, filled and overflowing with love. Imagine the love tumbling out of the top of your heart, through your shoulder, down the arm, the elbow, into the hands, why your very hand is warm with the overflowing love. Turn around now and give that love to the person behind you. To all of those who regularly worship in this church or in the television congregation, I invite you to uh, stay tuned this morning, for we will have the most distinguished His Excellency, the Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen, in this pulpit, bringing a message that you will long remember. And we'd like to mail you a copy of that transcript. If you'll write to me, Robert Schuller, Garden Grove, California, we'll be glad to do so. The supply is limited right today. Now, we have on this property the original Good Shepherd statue designed by Henry Van Wolf. And the artist has sculptured a medallion with the Good Shepherd and the sheep gathered around. We call it the Possibility Thinker's Medallion because on the reverse side is the Possibility Thinker's Creed. Based on the words of Jesus, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you can say to your mountain, move, and nothing will be impossible to you. On this medallion that we have had struck, is this creed which says, when faced with a mountain, I will not quit. I will keep on striving until I climb over, find a pass through, tunnel underneath, or simply stay and turn my mountain into a gold mine with God's help. Now, a very special friend made a special donation, and it is anonymous, but this beautiful medal which we've had struck through the generosity of a friend, only a few of these have been done in solid gold. And it was my privilege in this pulpit not many weeks ago to present the first solid gold medallion to Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, who preached the first sermon in this pulpit 10 years ago. And at this time, it is my privilege to present the second solid gold medallion to our guest of the morning. And I invite the Archbishop to come forward now 
and to receive this because he is indeed one of the world's greatest possibility thinkers. God love you. Thank you. And now to you worshiping in the walk-in church, in the garden church, and in the drive-in church, it is your privilege and opportunity to share your morning tithes and offerings with God. To all of you in the television audience, your offerings that you mail to us are used exclusively and totally for the purchase of this television time, which brings this church service to your bedside, to your hearth, or to your hotel room, or to your home. Simply write to us, Robert Schuler, Garden Grove, California. And to all of you who send us your letter with an offering this week, I want to mail you only today, and today only as a memento of this historic occasion, an exact uh, copy of the medallion that I'm giving to the Archbishop. God love you, God bless you, as we worship in this happy, holy hour.
Good morning. Now I want to send you one of the beautiful bronze memorial medallions like the one Dr. Schuler has just presented to Archbishop Sheen. This elegant medallion is a jeweler's design piece that will increase in value year after year. It's a beautiful, lasting memento of this historic occasion. One side is a replica of the statue of the Good Shepherd, and the other has the possibility thinker's creed. When faced with a mountain, I will not quit. I will keep on striving until I climb over, find a pass through, tunnel underneath, or simply stay and turn the mountain into a gold mine with God's help. This must be a one-time offer, never before and never again, today only. Dr. Schuler wants to present one of these medallions to you and gratitude to you who will stand with us in sending your generous offering today. Send your letter to Robert Schuler, Garden Grove, California. Robert Schuler, Garden Grove, California. We will also mail you this beautiful souvenir booklet that includes Archbishop Sheen's message and Dr. Schuler's remarks on today's Hour of Power. Send for yours today. Remember, this is a one-time offer that will not be repeated. Write today for your medallion and souvenir booklet to Robert Schuler, Garden Grove, California. Dr. Schuler will be grateful for your letter and your generous offering. And now, let us return to the service. God bless all of these beautiful people who have given their gifts to make this your wonderful work move ahead. Oh God, you know the name of every soul who has offered something of themselves to you now. Bless this through Christ our Lord. Amen. It's our privilege this morning again to receive new members into the fellowship of this church. The work of Jesus Christ is spreading across the country and wherever you live and are watching this television program, I have the wonderful news for you that Christ is reaching out for you too. And if you will, find a church around the corner and give your strength to make Christ's movement really explode with love and power in our nation. What the world needs now is love, more love. Now to you who are accepting Christ today, rise and come forward. And now abideth faith, hope, love, these three. The greatest of these is love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. Do you believe in God, your heavenly Father? And do you love Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And will you, with God's help, try to be the love of Christ the rest of your life? If so, answer, yes, truly, with all my heart. Yes, truly, with all my heart. Let's pray. Oh 
Thank you, God, for these people who are so beautiful because we see Christ in the deep part of their eye. Oh, God, bless them now and always. We pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Now, good friends, rise up and move out into the world to be a mind through which Christ can think, a heart through which Christ can love, and a hand through which Christ can touch with love and warmth. God bless you. Every week we have over 50 Protestant and religious groups worshiping in this church, and so this morning we choose to recite together the one statement that more than any other binds Christians together. We believe, and let us affirm it together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
That's why the Christian church has the best news in the world. We have good news for you today. In a moment, the good news will be brought to you by the Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. Before he rises to this pulpit, I wish to acknowledge with gratitude the guest musicians this morning. We have with us the choir from Central College, which is one of the outstanding, distinctive Christian liberal arts college in the, colleges in the United States. And I'm delighted to say that we not only have the choir, but we have the president, my friend, Dr. Weller and Mrs. Weller with us, and I'd like them to stand for a moment. I want to introduce them to you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Much could be said about the Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen, but this is a worship service, and I simply want to make one statement, and that is, there are three men who have been a particular deep inspiration in my life. Billy Graham, Norman Vincent Peale, and Fulton Sheen. And in a burst of faith, I wrote him a letter and asked him if he would do us the honor of preaching from this pulpit. As I said, I will be delighted, honored to step aside any Sunday to make room for you. I love Fulton Sheen because Christ lives in his life, and the Christ I love, the Christ who lives within me, and the Christ who is my Savior and my God is his Lord. So Christ will be speaking to us this morning through the Archbishop. Before I uh, call the Archbishop to the pulpit, I want to tell him that this is, they tell me, one of the world's first walk-in drive-in churches, and there are people worshiping in their automobiles. We started this 17 years ago in a drive-in theater because I had only $500. My wife was the only member I had. And we couldn't find an empty hall to rent, so to begin the church, we went in a drive-in theater. Well, now they tell me that there's a uh, Roman Catholic church that's running a drive-in confessional booth back east, Archbishop. They have a little sign by the window that says, toot and tell or go to hell. <laughs> Archbishop. <laughs> Thank you. God bless you. <laughs> Dr. Schuler, friends in Christ. Yes, I believe we do have a toot and tell church, but this motor drive in church is another idea. It is come in motors, you, and bring your pew. I can remember when I was a boy, I saw the predecessor, really, of this church. I was an altar boy in the cathedral of Peoria, Illinois, and immediately on the other side of the alley, there was a, an Amish church. And the Amish people used to come at nine o'clock in the morning and stay until five in the afternoon. And they would drive in 20 or 25 miles with horses, of course, and they had a number of barns, and they stalled their horses, and they ate their dinner there. This was the original drive-in church, I should want Dr. Schuler to know. <laughs> now, I am going to, uh, you people over here have a great advantage of me uh, over the rest. You get my better side, the back. I am going to try to bring home to you today, I think, the very essence of being a Christian, what it means. 
And since it is a profoundly spiritual talk, I am going to begin with a couple of examples. The first is about a Nazi guard who was on trial in Frankfurt. He said that at one time he was commissioned to burn about a thousand Jewish corpses that were piled up in a barracks. He was ordered to pour gasoline over them, set them afire. When he went up to pour the gasoline on them, all the bodies were nude except one. That was a young girl, about 18, alive. He said, what are you doing here? She said, I am a Jewess from Salonika. Do you think that I could live when all my other people are dying? Identification, point number one. Second story. There is a small group of people in Russia called the Eurodovy. Eurodovy in Russia, I am told, in Russian, means born fool. For the most part, these are Baptists. They go into concentration camps, and when they find that someone is to be punished, they ask that the scourging and the beating and so forth be given to them instead of to the guilty one. Their argument is this. If that prisoner is beaten, he will hate back. And the content of hate in the world will be increased. If, however, I love back, then I increase the content of love and forgiveness. They take on the punishment that was to be given to others. That's why they're born fools. I give these two examples to explain a text of St. Paul to the Philippians. I once heard someone read the epistle to the Filipinos not very long ago, but this was actually to the Philippians, in which St. Paul says that Christ emptied himself, emptied himself, when he became man, emptied himself of all of the appearance of glory and took upon himself the form of a slave, not servant, slave. In other words, our Lord would not remain up there in heavenly headquarters when there was suffering and pain and hate and disease in this world, just as that Jewish girl wanted to be identified with her own people so he will to be identified also with his own creatures. And secondly, when he took upon himself the form of a slave, he took on the punishment that we deserved. For by our sins, we deserve death. He took that death upon himself as if he himself were guilty. This is why we're forgiven. He was the original Eurodivy, the born fool. What humiliation did this require for God to become enfleshed? Well, let me give this example. Suppose you were very much concerned about the way dogs acted in Los Angeles. I wanted to cover a broad area here. <laughs> they didn't obey their masters. They barked at postmen. They scratched at front doors. They snapped at grocery men. And they never obeyed an order. And you wanted to teach the dogs of Los Angeles to be good. And suppose you had the power to empty yourself. Suppose you could tear off your body, empty yourself of your body, and just keep your mind, your soul, your spirit. 
and you would take this soul and spirit of yours and put it into the body of a dog. The first humiliation would be, though you knew that you had a mind that could conceive the stars, you would be guided by instinct. Though you knew that you could speak words, you would only bark. And you would subject yourself to all of the limitations of that canine organism. And a second humiliation, you would have to spend the rest of your life with dogs. Knowing that you were a thousand times better. If you would find it, you, then in the end, the other dogs, instead of following your example, would turn on you and tear you to pieces. Now, if you would find it humiliating to go into the body of a dog, what do you think it is for God to come into the body of a man? And to understand pain, identify himself with our suffering, weak humanity. Incidentally, here is the only answer there is to the problem of evil. It is asked, does, does God know anything about suffering? Does God know what it is to be a refugee? Was he ever born in a slum? Did he ever go without food for three days, or five days, seven days? Does God know what it is to have a migraine headache, as if his head was being pierced with thorns? Does God know anything about being a refugee and driven out of one country to another? Does he know anything about being in prison? Does he know anything about the accident wards and the people go in and come in in the darkness of night with wounded hands and feet? Yes, God knows what all of these things are. He took them and he bore them and he suffered them and then conquered them by the resurrection. This was the first humiliation of emptying and self-giving becoming like the rest of men. And secondly, he had to spend the rest of his life with stupid apostles. Slow to learn, tardy of intellect. We find it hard sometimes to deal with stupid people. Imagine the divine intellect dealing with fishermen, crude, uneducated minds, so that he would have to say the night of the Last Supper with sorrow, Philip, have I been with you all this time? And still you do not understand? Dealing with hecklers, protesters like Thomas. When our blessed Lord is talking about going to heaven, preparing a way for them, the heckler says, what do you mean the way? We don't even know where you're going. This is emptying. So he emptied himself of his glory and became man to atone for our sins. Now let us apply this to ourselves to make it very concrete. The incarnation of Christ means incarnate, in the flesh. It means that God became enfleshed. Mary gave him a human nature. That human nature was absolutely supple in his hands. It was totally obedient to him and to the Father's will. This is what Christianity means. 
that Christ is now saying to us today. Peter, Paul, Mary, John, Anne, will you give me another human nature? Give me a human nature like Mary gave me one. Give me a human nature that'll be so totally mine that I can teach through it, that I can act through it, that I can suffer through it, that I can redeem through it, that I can be kind and forgiving through it. So the incarnation is not something that happened. It is something that is happening. Take this pencil. This pencil is absolutely flexible and supple in my hand. I was glad I found this in my pocket. I wanted to use it as an example and I didn't think about it before I came. But this pencil is absolutely supple in my hand. If I wanted to write the word God, it will write the word God. That's the way the human nature of Christ was in his hands. That's the way he wants our human nature to be in his hands. Suppose this pencil, however, were endowed with self-consciousness. When I wanted to write the word God, suppose it wrote the word dog. I couldn't do anything with it. It would be useless. And so Christ can do a great deal with many of us. We're not supple in his hands. We're not obedient in his hands. And being a saint really means just giving ourselves so totally and completely to him that we're his. And the reason we get all crossed up is because, well, that upright finger is the vertical will of God. And my finger here is the horizontal, the horizontal finger is my will. And when I cross the divine will with my will, I get a cross. And in psychological language, that's a complex. I get all mixed up. Too many people today are concerned about identity. I want to be me, I want to be me. Nonsense! Who wants to be me? No lover wants to be me. First of all, it's bad, bad grammar, but we'll part from that. Nobody wants to be me. We want to be someone else's. When you love, I want to be thine. When we're Christian, I want to be thine. This is the essence of being a Christian. So in these brief moments, I hope that I've given to you now the challenge to give yourself totally and completely to him, be free. No, not to be my own, but to be his. I slipped his fingers. I escaped his feet. I ran and hid. For him I fear to meet. One day I passed him fettered on a tree. He turned his head and looked and beckoned me. Neither by speech nor speed nor speech could he prevail. Each hand and foot was pinioned by a nail. He could not run nor clasp me if he tried. But with his eyes, he bade me reach his side. For pity's sake, thought I, I'll set you free. Nay, take this cross, said he, and follow me. And so did I follow him who could not move, an uncaught captive in the hands of love. Thank you. Bye, and God love you.
And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may God grant unto you his peace in your going out and in your coming in, in your lying down and in your rising up, in your labor and in your leisure, in your laughter and in your tears, until you come to stand before Jesus in that day in which there is no sunset and no dawning. Amen. tuning in today. Now you need never lose the exciting memory of this unforgettable day. Dr. Schuler wants you to have a bronze possibility thinker's medallion like the one he presented today to Bishop Sheen. Years from now, your grandchildren will treasure inheriting this imperishable memento of today's historic interfaith service. But you must act now. This is a one-time offer that cannot be repeated. Send your letter to Robert Schuler, Garden Grove, California. That's all the address you need, Robert Schuler, Garden Grove, California. But do it now. Do not wait till tomorrow when you'll be rushed by your busy schedule. Dr. Schuler will be grateful for your letter and your generous offering. Be sure to ask for the medallion and a copy of the souvenir booklet of today's service. Remember again, for your medallion and today's souvenir message booklet, write today to Robert Schuler, Garden Grove, California. Because of the unusual high value of the medallions, we ask that you include with your request a generous offering. This is a one-time offer made only today. Send your letter today to Robert Schuler, Garden Grove, California. Till next week, I'm Ed Arnold saying goodbye and God bless you.